Hey everybody, welcome back to Sense 15. Um, before we get started finishing up the rest of the material that we almost got done with on um, Wednesday's lecture, um, I did want to address a couple of things. You may have um, already been notified that uh, UCSD has decided to extend our uh, remote learning until the end of January. So they're currently projecting that, or I shouldn't say projecting. They're currently planning on returning to in-person learning on January 31st, which is a Monday. Um, I wanted to. I would love to go back to in-person. So if that happens to occur, great, we will go back to in-person. But I did want to um, just remind you that I know changing that schedule up in the middle of the quarter is not easy. Um, and you will be able to complete this course remotely if that's what you decide is best for you. Um, so no matter what the university decides, uh, you won't have to worry about suddenly having to, you know, arrange a plane ride or something like that in the middle of the quarter to get back here um, to switch back over to in-person learning. So you will be able to continue um, remote learning, uh, but if we do end up going back to in-person, it'll just change a little bit, right? Instead of me here in a garage, um, it'll be a video of, you know, me in the um, lecture room where we were going to work. So you will be able to continue either way, um, but at least for the next, uh, the remainder of January, um, we're going to stick around here on Twitch and on Canvas, um, so I wanted to let you know. Along the same lines, um, if you'll remember from the syllabus, I place a, a fairly high emphasis on you, your own health, physical health, mental health, um, and I, it may be the case that because of where this class shows up in our curriculum, that this might be the first fully remote class that you've had at UCSD, if you didn't have any of them last time. Um, and I, even if it's not, it can still be a stressful situation. So um, I did want to bring your attention to a resource uh, that was recently made available. In fact, I was just notified of it um, earlier today, specifically for engineering students. Um, it's called Let's Talk. Uh, it's um, some informal one-on-one -on -one conver conversations or consultations uh, that are being offered by CAPS, which is uh, at UCSD. That stands for Counseling and Psychological Services. This is a stressful time, um, and things may be happening with work, with school, in your private life uh, that are impacting your learning environment or just impacting you in general. Um, and there are folks at USCSD uh, who will talk with you. And this particular one, Let's Talk, is reserved just for JSOE students, so just for engineering students. So you don't have to compete against some kind of a waiting list for all 20,000 students that are in um, UCSD classes right now. So I wanted to make you aware of this as a resource. Um, encourage you to use it if you would like to. This flyer is on our um, Canvas page under modules in the Let's Talk se section. So uh, if you need that resource, it's available for you. Um, I will continue to work with you as best I can in this class. Please let me know if, if anything's going on and we'll figure out a way to work through it. Um, like I said, your, your health is more important than the class. I will figure out a way for you to get through the class, right? We will work together to make it work. So with that, let's um, wrap up what we were talking about last time. Let me switch back over here to Excel. Um, we were finishing up our first project. So we had ended up with this um, chart, which was getting close. Um, we had begun to talk about indexing. The direction we're headed and that we will finish up today um, is to add these other remaining about two, two and a half features to the plot. We want to get this dot on our curve and we want to be able to connect the dot with a straight line down to the x-axis so that as we move the marker back and forth, um, it will automatically readjust that line and the dot, um, as well as the other element, which is this number up here at the top of the chart table, uh, or at the top of the chart, um, which is updating as that marker is moving. Um, so the, the point and the line are sort of an extension of the plotting features that we've already seen before. We haven't done quite that, but it'll be fairly similar. Uh, and then this new uh, feature up here of the text updating as the number changes, that's a new technique that we'll have to use. Um, that's going to take us about 30 minutes, and then we're going to introduce our first um, simulation for the class. Uh, so we will get to that in a moment, but in the meantime, um, let's finish up adding these elements to our, our chart. Where we had stopped on um, 
Wednesday's class was that we had created uh, this index feature, right? And we had linked that index, which is just an integer that runs from one to some number, um, to a marker counter. So we had a marker counter up here that we could use to adjust that index. And the thing that we used that index for was to imagine um, our vector of, for example, x data as this column vector with the sort of imaginary indices next to it, right? Not, not imaginary like i, like the imaginary number. It's just usually we don't see those ind indices. We wrote them here in light gray to remind us that they're there. Um, but what an index is is the location of a particular data point inside of a vector. Um, so for example, x, when we see the number 12, what that means is go into the vector x and look down 12 elements and return the value that's at that 12th position inside of x. And that's what the function is uh, here that I've got uh, displayed. The first input to the function is tell me what vector you're interested in, and the second input is tell me which row you're interested in, and then this index function will return the value at that position. And that can be extended to matrices as well. Um, if you were to instead provide, a, instead of a vector, provide a matrix, which is kind of like multiple vectors stuck next to each other, that's also fine. You just have to include then an additional index for not just the row, but also the column you're interested in. And we'll eventually get to indexing into to matrices as well. Um, but that was indexing. And we use that to extract whatever this number is, for example, 12, the 12th element of x and the 12th element of f of x. So let's now add these to our plot as a dot and then see how we draw um, a line on there. So I'm going to scroll over um, a little bit. Actually, I'm going to unfreeze some panes because we don't need the notes quite as much today. Um, but it would be nice to see uh, more of our working area. So I'm going to move it over like that. Uh, for me, when I go to add points to a uh, plot, I like to have it in this style that we've got over here. This is sort of my style. There are other ways to do it, but I like to have a column of the x values and a column of the y values. Or for this particular example, a column of the x values and a column of f of x values. So even if I'm just going to add a point, um, I like to have that in the same notation because it's a little easier for me to keep track of, of what goes where. So I'm going to create a small element down here or a small table, and I'm going to say this is my table for developing a point on my plot. And there's going to be an f of x column and a, an x column. Because it's just a point, any point on a 2D axis is defined by an x coordinate and a y coordinate, so we only need one element for x and one element for f of x. And they're going to be exactly the same as what we've achieved through indexing up here in these other cells. So I'm just going to have these point back to the previous value. So here where I want an x value, I'm just going to point that back to the indexed value that we extracted from x. And similarly for f of x, I'm going to have that point back to the indexed value for f of x that we extracted. So I haven't really done anything except reshape the two elements, right? Here they were x and f of x, and now I've reshaped them to f x and f of x next to each other. That's just my preference. I like to have my plots set up that way, um, because as we add more and more elements, it's nice if they always share the same um, organizational layout. Oh, and actually, before we go too much further, uh, let me save this as a more appropriate um, name so that I don't accidentally rewrite the old one, or overwrite the old one. So how do we add that point to our plot? Generally, the way that you add points to plots in Excel is you right-click and you go to Select Data. That's going to open up a window that shows you everything that's already there, um, as well as gives you the opportunity to add more data to it. So let's right-click on our chart and hit Select Data. Um, we can rename existing series, so I'm going to uh, edit this one change its series name uh, to curve. And so that reminds me that this data set that's sitting in here is referring to that long curve. You could call it normal curve or function or whatever you want it to do. And then to add data, if you click on that, you'll get a fairly straightforward window on here. You give it a name. So I'm going to call this one point. And then we're going to select the um, x values and select the y values, which in this case is just clicking on those individual values, right? We don't have to drag, uh, select anything, or, or click and select, or anything like that. Um, it's just those individual values. We could have equally just selected those other two values where we were doing the indexing operation, um, 
like I said, I just do this because I like it as an organizational tool. So I click OK. Um, I click OK again, and it's not anywhere on our plot. We have a problem. No, we don't have a problem. The issue here is that the plot that we're viewing right now is a scatter plot with a line, and we're trying to add a single point to it. So it, it can't draw a line until it has two points on that line, and we've only given it one point. Um, so we have to tell it, no, this particular data series that's on there, I don't want that to be a line. I want that to be a point. Um, and that comes from that stem convention that we had talked about on Monday, where generally curves and functions are drawn as continuous lines and straight segments, and data points are drawn as dots. So we're trying to stick with that convention here. To access that, we have to play a little bit of a game because we can't actually see the point on here. Um, but if you go up to Format, if sorry, I should say, if you click on the plot first and then go up to Format in the ribbon, the area that we're looking for is this Chart Area drop-down over here. So let me just highlight that a little bit. The first thing we did was uh, right-click on the plot, and then we went up here to Format. That was our second step. Uh, and then this Chart Area drop-down over here, uh, this was our third step. So if you can't see the data but you're pretty sure it's there, you can't obviously click on it because it's invisible. We can't see it. Um, but if you right-click Chart, Format, Ribbon, and then go over to the left um, on Chart Area, uh, and then the next thing we're going to do is select the thing that we're interested in. So uh, you'll see at the bottom there's series curve, that's our blue line, and there's series point, which is this point that we can't see. Click on series point, um, and then format selection, which is the button right underneath um, the series point that we just selected. That will bring up the same format series window uh, that we've seen previously when, for example, we would right-click on an axis and select Format Axis. Um, it brings up roughly the same thing. It's a little different because it's now editing a data series instead of an axis, uh, but it should look pretty familiar. Go over to the Paint bucket. Um, we're going to remove the line, so instead of Line, we're going to say No Line. And then if you shrink this window and look over at your marker, there's a couple of options for uh, the marker itself, the fill, and the border. The fill and the border are fairly self-explanatory. You can change the color of the fill or change the color of the border. Um, marker options is where you go to say, yes, I actually want a marker for this. So I like to go to built-in and select a circle, just because I'm in the habit of using circles. Um, and then under fill, uh, you can set it to anything you want. But since our other one was set to red, I'm also going to set this to red. Uh, and then just for being consistent, I'll change the border to red too so that it's a red fill inside of a red border. So again, what we did to get there was we went over here to Series Point, we selected Point, and then we said Format Selection, and we came over to this uh, bucket-looking thing for the fill of the line and the marker. Um, we turned the line off, and we turned the marker on by going to Built-in right here. And then we messed with the colors a little bit. And so now as we adjust our uh, marker button over here, you'll see indeed that dot is moving along that curve. Um, and so this is one way that we can kind of hack around the uh, functionality of Excel to make it look like a point is following a curve. Um, all we're doing, we've already generated the full curve. We don't have to recalculate it every time. Um, we're just looking at a different value. That's not to say you couldn't set up a spin uh, button that would just recalculate it, right? If, if you had a, a fixed amount by which you wanted to move it, you could set up a, a spin button that would recalculate it um, however you want and then update the plot that way. This is just the approach that we took here for this particular example. To add the line is similar. The reason I'm adding the line is because it, it's sometimes helpful to think about what does it mean to draw a line between two points um, and it's something that's going to come up on your homework. I think on problem three you have to build kind of a staircase looking plot um, and so it's helpful to think of what does it mean to take a straight up step and a straight left right step. So I'm going to create another little um, sort of area for a table down here. Uh, and this is going to be for our marker line. It's going to be um, a table of x values and f of x values. And we're going to start at the point, right? That We know that's one side of our line. So I'm just going to refer to the existing x and f of x values. And then I have to think, what does it mean to take a step going straight down? Well, that means the x value didn't change, but the y value switched to 0. 
Uh, and so here for the second point in this connecting line, I'm going to say make it the same x value, right? Just refer to the value right above it. Uh, but now make y equal to 0. That's what I mean by taking a step in a single direction. And it's exactly that sort of th thought process that you'll have to do on homework 3, where you have to step up and then over and then up and then over. You don't have to generate all the points in between those two points because Excel is already plotting these as a line between two points. So you just have to come up with the two endpoints, and it'll connect them by a straight line. You don't have to generate hundreds of values to draw a straight line on something. To add these, we do the same thing that we did to add the point. I'm going to right-click on the plot and say Select Data, Add a New Data Set. I'm going to call this one Line. I'm going to select my X values, which are these two values, and I'm going to select my Y as these two values, um, and hit OK. Uh, and there we have a gray line that sits on here now. To edit this, I can do a couple of different things. Um, I can select the chart and do what we did before with the point and go up here to Format, drop down to Series Line, and then say Format Selection. That's one way to get the window. A faster way, if you already have the data series visible, is to right-click on it and say Format Data Series. Right? E either one of those um, are, are different ways of achieving the same thing. There's even a third way where if you see it and you're familiar with the ribbon, you can go up here and mess with the outline, um, or I should say the, the fill uh, and the outline here. So I can change this over to, let's make that red, um, and we can change the weight to 1. All three of those are different ways of achieving the same thing. So if you can select the data, a lot of the formatting is already available, at least for colors, here on shape fill and shape um, outline. Uh, but any of those can be um, adjusted in greater detail uh, by right-clicking on the data series you want and going to Format Data Series. This is sort of the full um, set of options for uh, working on a data series like that. So that finishes uh, the controller uh, behavior that we wanted for this marker. You can see now that our marker is moving along, which is nice. That that's the behavior that we wanted. Um, and so we can move on to the very last part, uh, which is getting that text to show up. Uh, so over here, the text was up here at the top of the chart. And as we move the marker, the text would update to say, what's the current value of the marker? Both what is the x value that we've got and what is the y value that we've got. Um, so in order to do that, we have to introduce um, a new sort of concept. Um, it, it's usually self-contained within a particular function in any given language. Um, but the idea of combining, um, I'm actually going to delete these old notes because those are from last time. Uh, in order to combine stuff that's in some cases text and in some cases numbers, we use uh, a feature of most programming languages called concatenation. So concatenation. The idea of concatenating things um, means that you are going to combine letters and, well, actually not letters, let's say numbers first. The other thing that you're combining, um, we might call them letters, we might call them characters, uh, and we might call them uh, strings. All of those mean the same thing. They're the sorts of symbols that you would have on your keyboard, basically things that aren't numbers. Um, depending on which language you're using, it may be called a character, it may be called a string, uh, it could be called both uh, interchangeably in that uh, language. Uh, but in practical sense, we're talking about letters, right? The things that aren't numbers. Um, the concatenation operator in um, Excel is the ampersand. In Excel, oops, use the ampersand. The ampersand in Excel is on your 7 key. Um, if you hit Shift 7, it should give you the ampersand. And the way that you build this up um, is that you say something like equals, let's say you want to concatenate a number and some text. Uh, you would say, put the number in here, right? You would say number, 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 whatever the number is. Um, and then you would hit an ampersand, and then you would write your text inside of two quotes. So text inside quotes. So that the quotes are telling Excel the stuff in between these two quotes should be treated as letters, like text. Um, and then the ampersand is ta saying, take the number that you want here and glue it next to um, the text that you have here. 
So for example, uh, if my number is 7 and I wanted my text to read the number is 7, what I would do is write equals and then quote the number is end quote and then I would use an ampersand that's saying concatenate this text with the next thing and then you can click on the cell where your number is. That cell, by the way, doesn't have to contain a number. It could contain more text. There's, there's no reason that it has to be text followed by number or number followed by text, or that you have to use just one of each, right? You, you could concatenate number after number after number after number, as long as you put an ampersand next to each one. Um, so if I hit enter here, I get the concatenated string or concat concatenated uh, series of letters, which reads the number is seven. Notice there's a there's no space in between is and seven. You have to provide the white space. It doesn't automatically put white space in there, so you have to leave a little space. Excuse me after the word is uh, before you close those quotes. Um, otherwise, it will not know that those are there. So that's the basic pattern, right? You can mix and match strings and numbers and cell references and all that kind of stuff. And the glue that holds it all together is that ampersand. Um, the ampersand glues whatever's on either side of that ampersand um, into a single line of text. Um, and that process is called concatenation. So to practice that, um, uh, try to get something that looks like f of number, number, number um, is equal to number, number, number. Right? That's, remember, that's what we're after right now. If you look at the uh, style that the um, numbering system over here is giving, we've somehow concatenated some strings and some numbers in order to get the x on the inside of the parentheses and the f of x on the outside of the parentheses. So to practice concatenation, um, let's take about maybe three minutes here, here three minutes or so um, here, and we will come back at about 3.25. Um, so try, take the next few minutes and see if you can get that sort of concatenation done. Um, and I will double click on this one so that you can see the way that we did it um, in the example here. And I'll disappear for those three minutes so you can focus. Um, and then we'll be back in a little bit. about 325. So if I wanted to do this concatenation, um, always start with the equal sign. The first thing that I need here is a string, right? Because it's f of something. So I'm going to type uh, quote f open parentheses and then end quote. That's the first little chunk. And then I want to glue to that the value of x, which for us 
because we've got the index value of 27, happens to be minus 1.424. That's the first part. Now I need to add a little bit more strings because I want to close the parentheses that's on there. So I add another ampersand and say closing parentheses. I like white space between my equal signs, but you do you. Um, either way is fine. And close that particular string. Notice the complexity if you just look at a concatenation command it kind of looks messy, especially when you're combining concatenation with cell references and numbers. It's just the way that it is. Um, it's the way it goes. It's very common for me to forget quotes and get errors and stuff like that, so it takes a little bit of getting used to. But now we've got this part, and we need to glue on to the end of this the actual value of f of, f of x. So I'll do another ampersand and click on my f of x cell um, over here, and then hit enter. We got close to what we wanted, but it's kind of a mess, right? We get the whole number out to, what is that, like 12, 13 decimal points, 16, whatever the decimal points are. We usually don't want that level of precision, right? Most of the time, at least within this class, two, three digits of precision is plenty. We don't have to worry about that too much. Um, in order to reduce the number of digits on something, uh, most programming languages have a way to round a number. Um, and so we can use rounding in Excel by using the round function. Uh, so to round numbers, you say uh, equals round, and you give it the number that you want, and then you say number of digits, right? How many digits do I want to retain? Like usually number of digits, like I said, is two, three, sometimes you need four, um, but usually two or three is enough. Sometimes just one or an integer is enough. Um, and so now we can build up that concatenation a little bit further and say, well, I don't want just that. I don't want you to just show me the number, but actually round the number and then show it to me. Um, so I'm going to double click on this cell to open it up as a formula editor. And instead of I10, I'm going to say round I10. And I'm going to say round I10 comma 2, because I just want two decimal points um, to show up on there. And if I hit enter now, you'll see it's rounded that value. It's important to note that what's being rounded here is not sort of the source value, right? The full value of x still exists over here as this 1.424242 blah 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 blah. In fact, it actually exists that way in the chart that we made, right? In the two columns that we've got there. The rounding feature hasn't changed the original value. It's just changing the way that it's being displayed to us. So you want to be careful if you ever use rounding to know that it's only going to affect things that happen after the rounding. It doesn't somehow go backwards in the calculation and affect the value up ahead of it. It's also generally only a good idea to use rounding when you're displaying numbers. If you're calculating numbers, for the most part, none of the calculations we do are going to be so computationally intensive that there's any advantage to reducing the number of digits that are flying around. It's still going to be there. In fact, in MATLAB, when you round something to two digits, it's actually still like 16 digits. It's just all of those trailing digits are zeros. Um, so rounding doesn't really help the computer run any faster. Don't worry about how the computer is doing it. It'll handle the full digits just fine. We usually only use rounding when we have to display something because we don't want to see all those digits. Um, so we're going to do the same thing to the other side of that concatenated string that we've got there um, because I don't want to see all those digits of 556699 blah, 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 blah. So the other way to edit a formula in a cell, you can double click on it, which is what I did the last time. You can also click on a cell and hit F2 on your keyboard, um, and it'll move you to the end of the cell inside of there. Uh, and so I'm going to wrap the I11 in round comma 2 um, so that this value is also rounded to just two digits. So I hit enter, and there we go. Now I've got the, the string that I'm interested in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put this in bold uh, since these are the notes for the day. And this string now that we've built up that concatenation for, which is fairly complicated, right? If I had just dumped that on you without building it up one step at a time, there's a lot going on in there that it's easy to make a mistake with a parenthesis or a comma or a quote or an ampersand. I usually build it up exactly like I did right here, just to kind of check myself as I'm building it up to make sure it's behaving the way that I want. And then I go in and add the other stuff like rounding and stuff like that. That's got the behavior that I want. So you could imagine cutting this cell and simply placing it near the top um, of the plot like this. 
Right, so all I did was cut and paste that and move it over until it looks like it's at the top of the plot. Um, and then as I move the um, cursor, as I use the uh, spin counter to go up and down, it's doing exactly what we want. So we've kind of got the functionality of the final product over here in the sense that it is a number above the chart that is updating as we move the marker on the chart. That's what we were after. Uh, we're going to go one step further simply because that's not an option in MATLAB. MATLAB doesn't have this worksheet available where we can kind of fudge it, right, and put a plot here and kind of put an updating number above it here. I mean, I guess there is a way to do it, but it, it's more effort than it's worth. There's another way that we can do that in MATLAB that's a little bit more convenient for plots like that. Um, it would be nice if that number moved around with the plot, right? As I drag the plot, the number stays in one place. Um, whereas over here on the completed one, as I move this around, the number is sort of locked to the plot. That's nice because that information is conceptually linked to that plot, right? The f of something is related to that little point that's moving along our plot. So it's, it's nice if there's a, a link to it as well. So in order to do that, both here in Excel and in MATLAB, what we do is hijack the title of the plot. The title of the plot can be descriptive, but most of the time we don't need to title our plots, and so we can use that feature as a way to communicate extra information to whoever is looking at our plot. So the first thing we want to do is add the um, chart title back in there. You may already have it as chart title, which is fine. If you don't have it, um, click the plus button next to your chart uh, and select chart title from the um, checkboxes there. So there's our chart title, and it just reads chart title. You can enter text in there if you want, uh, but the other way to do it, if you want to enter something that changes as in response to a calculation, um, is to click on chart title, uh, and we can edit this just like we would um, a function. So what we can do is come up here uh, to the function bar, and we can type equals something, right? And we can start entering a formula there. Um, we can enter cell references, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're going to do is click on the chart title, um, and then come up here to chart something. Um, we're going to hit equals, and then select the cell here that's got all of our data inside of it. Um, I shouldn't say all of our data. It's got that string that we wanted to update. Uh, if we hit enter, now we've got the, the full functionality that we want. We've got a number, which is now being sort of stored inside of our um, chart title, or I should say a string stored inside of our chart title that updates as we move um, the cursor back and forth, or in other words, as we interact with the plot via the um, spinner that's up here. If we move the plot, the number moves with us, right? Which is kind of what we wanted, because those two things are conceptually linked. And as I said before, as far as, you know, if this was a spreadsheet of your own, it's probably enough just to put the um, concatenated string nearby the chart, and you would know what you mean, because you made the chart. Uh, but for other folks, it's if somebody else is going to have to read your stuff, it's nice if those two are linked a little bit more closely. And one way to do that is through hijacking the chart title. Um, and that's something that we'll use on a semi-regular basis um, once we get over to uh, MATLAB in probably not too long, maybe about a week or so, we'll, we'll fire up MATLAB and do a lot of this stuff. So there we have it. That is our first um, little miniature project. Um, it's got all the functionality we want with the marker moving around. We can adjust the standard deviation, adjust the mu, and everything's sort of auto-updating um, as we go through uh, and make each one of those changes. I can kind of drag the cursor over here and then maybe shift the mu back. Um, that's what we were after for our first um, project. So before I introduce the next one, I'm just going to pause uh, for about two minutes. Um, for any questions that you have, might have, or if you're a little bit behind what we've added on here, just a couple of moments here to kind of catch up with what we've got, because um, the next topic is entirely different, right? We're going to go on to a new project um, that's going to require a new set of skills for us. So I'm just going to sit here and pause for two minutes. Um, hang out, bear with me. If you got any questions, throw them in Canvas, um, and we'll be back at about 3.37 or so, something like that.
All right, about 3.37, that was about two minutes. Um, I did have one question too, uh, just to go over how we added the line on there too. So um, the method by which we did that, excuse me, just a second here. <coughs> uh, a little frog in my throat here. Um, I'm gonna delete the line first so that we don't actually have the line on there. Um, generally, whenever you wanna add another, uh, what we call a plot series to the plot or a data series to your plot, um, the first step is always to right click and say select data. Um, that's where you get to the window where you can add more stuff or edit or rename the stuff that's already there. Um, and so for this one, we would say add, um, and we want to do a line. So uh, I just call it a line. You can call it anything you want. Um, to select the X values, we would click and drag over potentially the whole column, right? If the line we wanted to add was over here, that original set of X, we could select all of those if we wanted to. It just so happens for this one, we only needed those two points at the end of the line. Um, so we select both of those. And then similarly for the Y values, uh, we would select both of the F of X values that are calculated in our little, t or I shouldn't even say calculated, stored in our little table down there. Um, and those become our, our Y values. Once you do that, you should get a quick preview of it on the plot itself. Um, and then you click OK. And now it has actually been added to your plot. Um, and then you would click OK one more. If you have to edit the um, line at all in terms of appearance, usually my go-to is to just right-click on the line itself and say Format Data Series. That's usually what I'm in the habit of doing. There's different ways that we can do it. Um, if you want to check the uh, recording, um, there's some other things that we can do. But usually I just right-click Edit um, or Format Data Series, uh, and that gives me all the access that I usually need um, for doing something. So just a, a brief review of how to add a line onto the plot. All right, so that was our first sort of mini project, right? It was just plotting, but we had to learn a lot of stuff inside of uh, plotting that you may or may not have needed before. There was this whole idea of variables and cell references and locking cell references and auto-filling arrays so that we can plot them. Now we've got concatenation and rounding and, and that sort of stuff. There was a fair amount in there. Oh, and don't forget the little spinners too, right? We had to make those. Um, all of those are going to become elements of things that you're going to need throughout the class. Particularly on homework one, everything that we've covered here covers up to about problem three on homework one. The remaining problems on homework one are going to refer to this next topic that we've got, which is our first simulation. Uh, so let's switch back over to the syllabus really quick so I can sort of talk you through where we are in there. If you scroll down to the bottom of the syllabus, you'll see that, um, as I mentioned in day one, I'll, I try to structure the class so that we've got projects to work on, right? We've got goals in mind. We're not just going to sit down and try to learn a language by sort of reading the documentation or something. We've, we've picked particular projects here um, that we can strive towards. And as we go, we'll pick up more and more sort of complicated features of the, the language that we're trying to learn. The first simulation that we're doing is the random walk. Um, Random walks come up a lot in a lot of different categories. Um, if you just check out the Wikipedia page, which is what I've got up here, you can scroll down a little bit and see random walks pop up in finance and genetics and physics and math and polymers, computer science, images, brain research, vision science, psychology. Right? I'm just assuming that Wikipedia has that right, because that all sounds right to me. I've seen it used in a lot of different places. Of course, we're going to focus on random walks uh, from sort of a physics or an engineering perspective. Um, I would note that a really neat application of this is procedurally generated art. Um, this is a, a picture of a statue here called Quantum Cloud. Um, the stuff that we're going to do, I think, actually has the ability to be pretty interesting art. Uh, so the types of images that we're going to generate um, are actually located a little higher in um, Wikipedia's list. These images of thousands and thousands of steps in a random walk, um, I think lend a, a, a certain appeal to them. I, I'm really interested in the, the intersection between art and science or, or art and engineering. Um, and in fact, once we eventually return to in-person learning, our class takes place in one of the lecture studios for the Maker Studio. Right across the hall is a laser cutter, a vinyl cutter, a whole bank of like two dozen 3D printers. Um, and you can actually make these 
objects as sort of small sculp sculpture pieces or, or wall art or something like that. You can do the steps in three dimension, right, like they showed down here, and get sort of a, a strange shape on it or, or even the um, statue itself down here. So I'm not intending this to be artistic, but at the same time, I think it has a certain beauty to it um, to, to see that randomness can generate the shapes that we're interested in. In the long term, at least for this project, we're actually going to go a little bit further on the analysis side and show that even though the steps are random, there's a certain amount of predictability to the way that the randomness is behaving. Um, the numbers are truly random, or as close as a computer random number generator can get, um, but there is a trend to them. The type of motion or the type of random walk that we're going to study is called Brownian motion, um, which you may have heard of uh, in the context of, I think they were like mustard seeds or something like that. Anyway, large seeds in liquids. And this red disc here represents sort of a macro scale object um, located inside of a fluid, maybe a gas or a liquid. And as the small bearings here hit the larger disc, those are here meant to simulate the small uh, atoms of gas or molecules of gas or molecules of liquid hitting this larger object. And if you focus just on the larger object, it looks like it's just taking random steps in certain directions whenever those smaller particles hit it. Um, and we're going to focus just on the random dot, right? What are the steps that the, or sorry, the red dot. What are the steps that the red dot is taking um, as it moves around? We're not going to worry about the temperature aspect like they're doing here, um, but just this behavior of the red dot stepping around. In your homework, you're going to simulate those steps in addition to the way that we're doing it in here on class. Also, shout out to St. Mary's for making their great demo here of um, Brownian motion. You're going to take steps in arbitrary directions, um, but we're going to start with steps on what's called a lattice. So steps on a lattice, um, I've got the uh, finished project here. Let me uh, shrink the um, ribbon up here. This red dot represents that same red dot that we saw before, right? That's the red dot that's going to take these random steps, presumably because it's getting kicked around by smaller molecules or something like that. Um, and we're going to track its path. So each time uh, we take a new step, we pick a direction, left, right, up, or down, and we take a step in that direction. Um, and so what you can see here is our plot in Excel is slowly building up um, a certain level of complexity as the little red dot keeps taking steps, right? It goes left, it goes right, it goes up, or it goes down. And that's all it's allowed to do, right? It's stuck on this grid, which in the parlance of these kinds of simulations is called a lattice. Um, so this is a 2D lattice. It can step left or right, up or down, um, but only on the grid that we've got here. We're not actually going to add the functionality of the spinner on here. We're going to calculate all the steps at once, although it is not beyond your capabilities now because you know how spinners work to add that functionality if you want. But we're just going to focus on generating the whole random walk more or less all at once and plotting it all at once, um, not, but not sort of simulating the step uh, one thing at a time. In order to do that, we need to think a little bit about what it means in order to move around on a lattice like that. Um, so I'm going to switch back over to our previous one um, and add a new sheet. Oh, there's our sheet. Rename this as random walks. And we're just going to spend the rest of the like five minutes or so that we have in class talking about what it means to take a random walk on a lattice and how we might implement that. So if we imagine um, our red sphere, or red particle, or whatever you want to call it, red circle. Um, let's have that here. If we're on a lattice, we've only got four options. We can step to the right, to the top, to the left, or to the bottom. Uh, and we're going to fix the distance there. We're always going to say that that step distance over here to the right, so if we want to step, I'm just going to abbreviate these um, by their sort of first letters. If we want to step to the right, that's the direction that we go. Um, this unit length here, or I should say this length is always unit length, we're going to define this as a step size of 1. We don't really care what the units are, it's 1 centimeter, 1 foot, 1 angstrom, whatever. It, it's, it's just 1. Don't worry about the units right now, um, we're not going to define those. We could alternatively step um, to the top, or we could step uh, to the left, or maybe not step uh, top, let's say step up with a U. Um, or we could step to the left, 
uh, or we could step going down. The way that we apply those steps is to think about the two-dimensional coordinate system that the particle is represented by. So if the particle, for example, is initially at the center point, we would call that position x and position y. Right? Its x-coordinate is x, its y-coordinate is y. If we go off to this side, to the right, we're saying add 1 to x. If we go up, we're saying take y and add 1. Left corresponds to x minus 1, and down corresponds to y minus 1. And if we think about how do we actually take the step, like what's the math that we have to do? Uh, so for example, if we wanted to take a right step, we would start off at x and y, and then when we take the step, we end up at x plus 1 and y. So there's no change to y, but x got um, incremented by 1. Even more specifically, in the way that we're going to need to do it, it's not just that y didn't change, but it's a little bit more convenient to say 0 got added to y. Mathematically, that means the same thing, right? It, it did not change, but it's a little bit easier to code plus 0 than it is to code don't change anything. Don't change anything is sort of difficult for uh, a system to understand, although it's, it's doable. Um, and in fact, we will practice doing that on uh, MATLAB. MATLAB can do it a little bit easier than um, Excel can. This concept of, or I should say, once we do that, we would then continue on, right? The, the next thing that we would do is now our position is not x and y, but it's x plus 1 and y. And now we're going to take another step. Say maybe this step is going down, right? We want to go down x is unchanged, so it's still x plus 1 relative to the original one, but now it's y minus 1. Right? And we would just keep doing that over and over and over and over. Uh, we would do this, at least in Excel, we're going to do this on the order of several thousand steps. So several thousand steps down here. When we get to MATLAB, we're going to up that to about 10,000, 20,000, 30, maybe even 100,000. We'll see what it does. That process of doing something over and over and over um, is a very important one that's called iteration. Um, and that's where we're going to leave it today, is just the, the concept of the word iteration means do something over and over and over again, or do something uh, repeatedly. Usually with iteration, we know how many times we need to do it. So we might say, I know out the outset I'm going to take a thousand steps. And so we let the computer go through a thousand steps um, of what we're trying to do. If we don't know how many times we have to do something, there is a way to still ask the computer to do it and still some, until some condition is met. Um, but we're not going to get to that until a little bit later. The reason we're practicing iteration here is because in MATLAB, the way that we do iterations um, is inside something called a for loop. For is a reserved keyword inside of MATLAB, and so I want you to make the link between for, for loop, or iteration, and this process that we're going to go over for the next maybe two days or so with this uh, random uh, walk that we're going to generate. We're doing the same thing over and over and over again um, with small increments, right? Somehow we know what we did last time, and we're taking that status, that state of our simulation, and we're doing it again, but we're making a small change, right? And then we're just going to do that over and over and over and over again. And I want you to uh, associate that concept with a for loop, with the idea of iteration, uh, because it's a very useful process, and it's going to come up again and again and again in here um, as we do more and more simulations. So it's, it's something that I want you to be, get um, comfortable with. But we're going to leave it there. We're going to come back to this on Monday. Um, it is 3.51. I do apologize for going over by about a minute here. Um, enjoy your weekend. Try to get some, some me time in there where you can de-stress a little bit. Um, homework's not due until not this Monday, but the, I think the following Monday. So it's still time to work on that. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and we will see you back here on Monday. Bye, everybody.